in this video, I'll talk about membranes, some general principles, and then some specific examples. Membranes uh, encompass or surround every cell, uh, bacterial, archaeal, um, and eukaryotic cells, as well as any internal membrane-bound um, structures. So the, the properties of the membrane are there's a phospholipid bilayer or similar layer. Some have different um, layers, uh, different types of chemicals uh, making up their membrane. And, and then there are uh, proteins embedded in them. And the uh, amount of protein ranges from anywhere from about 25% in some membranes to up to 75% uh, in things like the thylakoid membrane in, um, in chloroplasts. So the membranes um, then uh, separate the inside of the cell from the outside. So the proteins embedded in the membrane are responsible for receiving and transmitting information from the outside to the inside, as well as import and export of molecules. So those are highly controlled. Uh, but the uh, expansion of the membrane um, allows flexibility of the cell and allows movement uh, in some cell, some types of cells, not all cells. Uh, most of the membrane, uh, most of the membrane types, uh, consist of a phosphatidylcholine. Uh, most, this is most common in bacterial and eukaryotic membranes. So there's a long, straight, um, saturated hydrocarbon tail, another one that usually has at least one double bond, which forms a kink uh, in, that, um, in that one chain. Those are connected by a glycerol molecule, which is a three carbon um, alcohol. And then one of those is attached to the pho a phosphate and then another molecule, in this case, a choline. So this is uh, what it looks like uh, in the membrane. Because these molecules are somewhat flexible, uh, you can get them flipping, uh, twisting around, uh, occasionally uh, flipping and flopping from one side to the other side. And so um, you have normally an, uh, an extracellular part and an intracellular part. Uh, the extracellular part often have uh, glycolipids, and so they'll have instead of a phosphate choline head, they'll have a sugar head. Uh, and also there are other things in the membrane, such as cholesterol molecules, uh, which uh, increase the rigidity of that membrane. So in cells that are in uh, sort of high temperature situations, they'll have usually more of the uh, cholesterol and uh, cells that are in lower temperature environments will have less of the cholesterol. And there are several types of cholesterol um, so that um, depending on the types that are added or taken away, that will also change the fluidity of the cell membrane or any membrane. You can actually get these uh, membranes to form spontaneously and probably in the original cells on Earth, this is how it happened. Um, if you have this lipid bilayer, uh, the outside uh, likes to be around water. It's in an aqueous phase. The inside is hydrophobic. And then the other side is hydrophilic. So you can actually uh, mix a bunch of these molecules together uh, in, some, in water, and they'll spontaneously form these balls with water on the inside, water on the outside, and this double membrane, or this double uh, layer of phospholipids. Um, and as I said, embedded in those are proteins, including proteins that uh, span both um, uh, layers of the membrane, some that span only one layer of the membrane, and some that form uh, special pores or transporters uh, uh, through the membrane. So this allows discrimination uh, as to what's inside the cell on one side and what's outside the cell on the other side. So that um, very small molecules such as oxygen, uh, CO2, and to some extent water and, and benzene and nitrogen, those can go across the membrane fairly readily. Uh, some small uncharged polar molecules such as water, glycerol, and ethanol also can cross the membrane, but to a limited extent. However, larger uncharged and polar molecules such as amino acids, glucose, and nucleosides uh, cannot. And so specific transporters are necessary to move those across the membrane. Also, 
Uh, large and small molecules that are charged cannot go through the membrane because of that hydrophobic region in the middle formed by those fatty acid chains. And so uh, protons, sodium, carbonate, etc. Uh, cannot go through that membrane but require specific um, ports and transporters to cross the membrane. So this means you can keep the molecules and ions and things that you need inside the cell you can also keep other things outside of the cell and therefore control the function of those cells. For bacterial membranes, there are two major groups of bacteria. Uh, Gram-positive um, uh, bacteria have only one uh, cell membrane plus a cell wall. So there's a cell membrane. And then there's a cell wall made up of uh, peptidoglycans. The gram stain interacts with those peptidoglycans, uh, which stains those cells kind of a purple color. The other type are uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria, which have two membranes, this inner, inner plasma membrane and then the outer membrane, which has a lot of uh, lipopolysaccharides attached to it and then a thin peptidoglycan cell wall in the middle, but the gram stain cannot penetrate the outer uh, membrane so that these come out um, not staining with the gram stain or being uh, gram negative. So these are called monoderms and these are called diderms over here. And there's one hypothesis that states that uh, diderms were formed by an endosymbiotic event between two monoderms, so that then you get two membranes rather than just one. But that's only one of the hypotheses for the origination of the diderms. The um, structure and um, makeup of the archaeal cell membranes is uh, quite different from that of bacteria and eukaryotes. So <clears throat> in Bacteria and eukaryotes, you have fatty acids that are unbranched, often with a double bond in one, so it's kinked. And then there's a ester linkage to the glycerol molecule, which is a deglycerol, and then the phosphate, and usually another molecule attached to the phosphate. Archaea usually have branched isoprene chains, uh, a little more stable and attachment to L-glycerol by ether link linkages rather than ester linkages, and then the phosphate group and a, and a um, head um, molecule on top of that. Also, in some archaea, uh, it's a monolayer, and so there's no separation between um, this uh, phospholipid all the way through the membrane to the other side, and you'll notice it's not quite a phospholipid on the other end. They also have different branching chains, usually isoprenes. Here's one that's a uh, bilayer here. This is also a monolayer with some other um, uh, strange uh, fatty acid groups in there. And then you get to the uh, bacteria and eukaryotes, which have a more um, standard um, cell membrane that we're used to seeing with the two um, fatty acid chains attached through a uh, deglycerol by ester linkages. Uh, when these are measured uh, by permeability to protons, you find that these ones here, archaea, have very low permeability of protons. And many of these ones with just this mono, these monolayers are found in acid uh, conditions so that uh, they can exclude the protons. They don't want, they don't want uh, the damage done by those protons. Whereas you go over here and there's much higher uh, allowance of protons to go uh, flow through the membrane. So in plant cells, you find many different membranes. Uh, there's the cell membrane that's just inside the cell wall. And that's actually continuous uh, from one cell to the next through these plasmodesmata. So the cytosol goes through there and there's a membrane that goes through there too, um, uh, which allows a continuous um, contact from one cytosol to the other, but it is a controlled, uh, a, a controlled flow. Then there's the nucleus, which as I said is a double membrane, but it's really a single membrane folded over on itself with nuclear pores um, dotted uh, through there, where the RNA is usually leaving and proteins are coming in from the cytosol that have been uh, translated out there. 
a double me membrane system in a true double me membrane system in the chloroplasts and mitochondria. And then there are many single membrane uh, organelles as well. Golgi, plasmodesmata, um, vacuole, peroxisomes, and others. While the phospholipid bilayers in each case are fairly similar, um, the proteins that are embedded in those membranes uh, are very different from one organelle to the next. And then if you look at animal cells, um, they also have a, a, a phospholipid bilayer. And it's fairly flexible, and this is why animal cells can move around by uh, shifting around their uh, microtubules and um, other organelles, uh, actin and myosin, filopodia. Uh, but again, you have a membrane going around the cell, the, the um, nuclear membrane, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, Golgi, and some other organelles that have uh, single membranes around them. So as I said, the nuclear membrane really is a single membrane folded over on itself, so it looks sort of like a double membrane system. And that membrane is actually continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum, both the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which has ribosomes dotted uh, all over it, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is an outflow of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The uh, membranes uh, of the mitochondria are double. Uh, it is a double membrane system. So there's an outer membrane, and then this is the one is showing the inner membrane where you have oxidative phosphorylation going on uh, in the what are called the Christi of the um, inner membrane. And so you have a double membrane system, and these are true double membranes in that um, there's a phospholipid bilayer here, phospholipid bilayer there, and then the outer membrane would be the same, and these would not be connected in any way. Uh, and then you have these proteins embedded in them, which are um, parts of the oxidative phosphorylation electron transport chain. So the electron electrons flow through the membrane through these proteins here and wind up uh, to make water in the end from oxygen and protons. And the phosphorylation part is these protons flowing through uh, ATP synthase to make ATP, uh, and uh, which is then used in the mitochondria and in other places in the cell. Uh, chloroplasts also have uh, um, two membranes, and you can consider a third one if you consider uh, the thylakoid membrane. So they have an outer membrane, and then an inner membrane, and then the thylakoid membrane where all the photosystems are located. Uh, the inner membrane and the thylakoid membrane are continuous, so they fold around and make uh, these invaginations that become the thylakoid membranes. And again, this is a, an electron transport chain where you have light uh, splitting water. Uh, the protons wind up uh, in the thylakoid membrane, and the uh, electrons move down the electron transport chain through proteins. Eventually, uh, these proteins then, or these uh, protons, flow through ATP synthase to make ATP. Uh, to uh, use the energy to make sugars and starches and other things in the uh, chloroplast for that uh, plant cell. Uh, another set of uh, membrane proteins are structural elements, that is cytoskeletal elements, and in animal cells these consist of um, some proteins that um, <clears throat> are embedded in the membrane as well as proteins that uh, then connect those elements together to make a structure of the cell so it can change shape, um, it can uh, move around in the, in the case of animal cells. In the case of plant cells and other cells with cell walls, they don't move, but um, those are also cell, uh, cytoskeletal elements, but of a diff very different sort. Some of the main um, functions of um, these cytoskeletal elements on the cell are to organize patches of uh, proteins on the membrane uh, for special purposes, attachment sites to external media or to uh, other cells, and then cell-to-cell -cell attachment and signaling. So cells often uh, have, um, they uh, sort of talk through their membranes using proteins. And also there are 
asymmetric um, arrangements of proteins and other um, other uh, molecules embedded in the membrane for special purposes, such as uh, to have different functions on do both sides of um, of the cell, uh, in, uh, including epithelial cells that <clears throat> have uh, certain types of proteins on one side and other types of proteins on the other pole of that cell. Uh, there is a large um, diversity of proteins that uh, span the membranes or are embedded in the membrane one way or another. So one type um, of these are transporters, transporting constituents into or out of the cell. Um, anchors, which I just talked about. Um, there are anchors within the membrane and then proteins joining the anchor. So you can have cell, um, cells changing form and, and actually moving. Uh, there are also receptors that um, take a, a ligand on the outside. And once the ligand is bound, the um, other part of the protein that's inside the cytosol uh, signals the interior of the cell in one way or another. And I already talked about the uh, insulin receptor in a previous video, uh, and there are many other types of receptors too. Um, then there are enzymes uh, that are embedded in the membrane and um, enzymatic activity inside the cell, occasionally outside of the cell. Um, and many types of ways of uh, either going uh, through the membrane or existing on one side or the other. So you have transmembrane proteins that can have one side on the on the extracellular space side and one side in the cytosol. Some of them have many um, alpha helices that um, span the membrane going into and out of the cell. Uh, several times, and some of these form pores, and others of them have other special functions. Uh, of course, uh, beta barrels also can uh, be formed to uh, be transmembrane uh, pores. Some types of proteins are anchored on the inside, or they can be anchored on the outside part of the membrane, uh, either the extracellular side or the cytosolic side. And they can be anchored by part of the protein, usually by a um, alpha helix, uh, but some of them are attached to lipids, and so they're anchored in the uh, phospholipid bilayer by lipids themselves. Then there are others that are just um, ephemerally attached by attaching to other proteins that are on the membrane. So these ones are uh, attached to a pro another protein that spans the membrane. And many of these are detachable, so uh, in some cases... They would be attached to the other protein, the protein that goes through the membrane. And in other cases, under different circumstances, they can pop off or move or perform, perform some other function. And this occurs quite a bit in uh, intracellular um, signaling. Uh, part of these are um, called signal transduction, where you take a signal from the outside, bring it to the inside of the cell, and then different proteins move around within the cell uh, to signal different functions. Uh, when proteins traverse a membrane, then they have a special form. So in the case of a alpha helix, then the outer surfaces of that alpha helix, the amino acids on the outside, uh, would, are expected to be, in, in most cases, are hydrophobic. So they interact with the, the lipid groups, the hydrophobic lipid groups in the middle of the membrane. Um, if they form a pore, then uh, they can form uh, in this way where there are alpha helices in a ring structure. And so the outside of the ring would be hydrophobic, but the internal pore uh, would be hydrophilic. And so it would be an aqueous pore allowing uh, transport of um, molecules through that central pore part, uh, at least move certain types of uh, chemicals through that port that are not hydrophobic, that are hydrophilic. The same with these beta barrels on the outside, the amino acids would be hydrophobic in uh, interacting with the lipid bilayer, and the middle pore uh, 
of that uh, beta barrel would be hydrophilic, allowing um, molecules that are uh, dissolved in water uh, to move from one side of the membrane to the other. Uh, regarding moving through uh, those proteins through the membrane, uh, there are transporters that change their shape to allow um, the movement of a um, solute, an ion or something like that, to move through, and that's called a transporter. There are also channel proteins that have uh, a gap in them and allow the movement of the um, particular ion or solute to move through that pore. Also, there are two types of transport. Passive transport, which just simply allows a certain molecule to pass through um, that's based on a concentration gradient. So you'd have a higher concentration on one side and a lower concentration on the other side. And when that pore is opened, then there's free movement uh, based on the concentrations of those solutes on either side of the, of the membrane. There's also active transport, which requires uh, usually an input of ATP. And most of the time that is to move against a concentration gradient, to put things on, that are at lower concentration into an area of higher concentration against the uh, concentration gradient uh, by using ATP to do that. And there's uh, quite a bit of diversity, many different types of transporters. Uh, one just moves with the concentration gradient. So it allows the attachment of the solute uh, in one part of the molecule that changes the conformation. And then it opens up on the other side to release um, that solute into, uh, in this case, inside the cell. <clears throat> there are also coupled transporters. So they often, uh, this is an antiporter, which transports some molecules outside and other uh, molecules inside. Uh, one of the very important ones in um, uh, animal cells are sodium-potassium transporters, and I'll talk about those more in detail later. Also, there's an AT-driven uh, pump. One of these is a calcium pump. There are also sodium pumps. And so this is uh, using ATP as uh, energy to open a passage uh, through this transporter to move things against uh, either an electrochemical or a concentration gradient. <clears throat> there are also light-driven pumps that act against the electrochemical or concentration gradient by using light energy to activate uh, certain molecules, usually chlorophyll or rhodopsin, uh, to move um, ions across the membrane in one direction against the gradient again. Rhodopsin is an example of a light-driven uh, pump. So this is one where there's a chromophore in the middle, in this case retinol, which absorbs light of a certain wavelength. And in doing so, it changes uh, its conformation and opens this pore up, uh, which allows hydrogen ions, protons, to, to move through. And that um, uh, change in concentration of protons then stimulates a neuron and sends a signal to the brain that a certain type of light is uh, hitting that particular uh, receptor. Um, different membranes inside of a eukaryotic cell and prokaryotic cell too. Different membranes have uh, different receptors, um, different membrane proteins on them. So in the case of the plasma membrane around a cell, it'll have nucleotide um, transporters, sugar uh, transporters, amino acids, and sodium uh, transporters, which uh, put, send sodium out actually of the cell. Um, and a lysosome, a lysosome will um, allow protons to go through, which will acidify that lysosome. And then, of course, mitochondria have um, transporters to import uh, pyruvate and export ATP as they produce that. Um, here's an example of a cell that has some types of transporters on one side of the cell, and other types of transporters on the other type, uh, other side of the cell. And this would be um, a cell in the gut lumen, the gut lining, uh, which is then um, 
going to import sodium and glucose through those cell membranes. So it has a, a glucose sodium transporter on one side. So the sodium is moving with the um, concentration uh, gradient uh, because the sodium is being taken out by a sodium potassium pump on the other side. So the concentration of sodium drops. Uh, that allows the um, uh, movement of sodium into the cell and that uh, forces the glucose also into the same time in that symporter. So that brings glucose into the cell, that increases the glucose concentration into the cell, and there's a passive transporter um, on the other end of the cell. So a higher concentration of glucose in the cell than out of the cell, so just passively by a concentration gradient, this glucose passes through this other transporter. So this is all driven pretty much by this sodium potassium uh, pump, uh, which uh, requires ATP to do that. So down here, this sodium potassium pump uh, requiring ATP is sort of driving the system, uh, moving uh, sodium out of the cell, reducing the sodium ion concentration, which causes the sodium out here to um, uh, be at higher concentration and uh, move into the cell through this symporter the movement of the sodium in uh, into that symporter also takes glucose in that raises the concentration of glucose, which then flows out uh, through a transporter that's passive because of the difference in concentration of glucose in and out of the cell. Um, ion transporters turn out to be very important. Um, in animal cells, it's mainly potassium, uh, and sodium and proton pumps that are important. Um, in plants, it's primarily just proton pumps. So in, um, in animal cells, you have a potassium-sodium or sodium-potassium um, transporter, which uh, requires ATP to do that function. And then there's a sodium-driven symport with a solute such as glucose going into the cell. And then there are um, uh, proton ATPase uh, transporters, again, requiring ATP, and this would be important in, to acidify the lysosome. In plants, on the other hand, uh, primarily proton pumps. So there's a, a proton pump that pumps uh, protons out of the cell uh, that requires ATP. There's also a, a SIM port that takes protons into, and at the same time, solutes uh, into a plant cell. And then to acidify the vacuole, which is similar to a lysosome in some, in some ways, uh, there's also a proton ATPase uh, pump, again, requiring ATP to pump those protons against the gradient into the vacuole, uh, thus acidifying the vacuole. There are um, several different types of pores or channels also. So there's a voltage-gated channel important in neurons. So when um, you have high polarization <coughs> of the um, membrane, then the port is closed, and then or the channel is closed, and when you reduce that uh, potential, then that opens up, allowing ions to flow freely through there. Uh, there are also ligand-gated um, uh, channels which require a ligand of some sort of molecule to attach to the outside to open that up. Uh, there are also one uh, ligand gated that are interior to the cell also to open up that channel. And there are also ones that are stress gated. Um, and I'll show you a couple of examples of those where these um, Parts of the protein are attached to something else. Uh, when that is stretched, then that opens uh, that channel to uh, the flow of uh, particular ions. And here are two of those, the stress-gated transporters or channels. Uh, one occurs in your ears. So there are um, cells called auditory hair cells that are next to one another, and connecting them is um, a ligament that when those two 
hair cells move with respect to one another. Uh, that opens a um, uh, a gated channel, which then allows ions to flow in, and that starts a um, action potential in the adjoining neuron and sends a signal through the neuron uh, that a um, a sound of a particular um, type, uh, wavelength, and volume has been uh, picked up by those nerve uh, those uh, hair cells. And in the case of these hair cells, it is opening uh, sodium channels. Uh, in the Venus flytrap and other um, insectivorous plants that um, sort of envelop their prey, um, there's also uh, a similar uh, thing that happens in that there are hair cells inside those traps that when they are triggered, usually three of them at a time, uh, that then signals the opening of uh, channels for protons and for water. And then you get this transfer of water from one part of the um, leaf to another. And that causes movement of the leaf to close over the prey, what has become the prey. So now I want to talk about a few specific pumps uh, that lead us into a discussion of how a neuron works and how an action potential is sent down the neuron. Um, it starts with a uh, sodium-potassium pump, uh, which is ATP-driven. So in this case, it's um, increasing the concentration of sodium ions on the outside of the cell and increasing the uh, number of potassium ions inside the cell. Um, so it's uh, an antiporter transporting uh, sodium out and potassium in. So the process starts uh, by sodium attaching in a certain point uh, in that protein. And then hydrolysis of ATP changes the conformation of that protein, uh, closing one side and opening the other side out, up so that the sodium flow, flows out. Uh, then that allows the potassium to bind to that same site. Uh, the phosphorus um, is lost on, uh, on the protein. It, again, changes conformation back to its original form which expels the, so, the potassium on that side. And then it's ready to accept another sodium in that spot and uh, repeat the process. There are two other um, types of um, channels uh, in the, on the neuron membranes. Uh, these are non-gated potassium channels, which are partly open. And then there are sodium channels that are completely closed. So initially, there's a buildup of sodium on the outside of the cell, and so it's depleted in sodium inside the cell, and the opposite is true for the potassium. But there's a little leakiness here, so there's actually um, a little more potassium and a little more positive charge on the outside. Once a, um, a, a um, electrical charge is sent to this membrane, that channel opens up, and allows the potassium to flow in one direction, the sodium flows in the other direction, and then <clears throat> that um, produces a net positive charge inside of the cell, uh, which is called then an action potential. Um, there's enough of, of a change, a difference in the membrane potential from one side of the membrane to the other um, for the next part of the um, neuron membrane to respond to that. So this can actually be measured in the neuron. So if you have a stimulating current, what happens is you get what's called an action potential. So if you look at the membrane potential on the inside, it, the inside of the cell is negatively charged with respect to the outside of the cell. And so when you get this action potential, it actually flips open this uh, pore um, and opens the channel so there's a little gate on one side and a channel as well. And then once the ions start flowing, you get um, a net positive charge built up on the inside of the cell. 
this causes a closing of that lid so then no more um no more of the um potassium and sodium ions can flow uh then that other pump the uh potassium sodium pump that's then pumping the sodium outside of the cell causes a return to that negative uh, charge on the inside of the cell. This little lid flips up and that pore closes and it's ready to go through the next part of the action potential or to respond to a difference in the electrical potential from one side of the membrane to the other side. So then if you measure the voltage along a neuron, along the axon of a neuron, you can see these action potentials being set up all the way down the line. So you start here with this action potential. This changes um, the uh, membrane, the electrical potential on one side of the membrane versus the other. That eventually starts going down, but that triggers the next area. And that starts going down, but that triggers the next area so that you get this propagation of that um, action potential uh, moving down the axon. So this shows a little more detail that you stimulate uh, a neuron that opens those uh, sodium channels to uh, so that the sodium flows into the cell. Uh, this increases the positive charge within the cell, <clears throat> which then stimulates other um, of the of the um, channels down the road to open up <clears throat> and movement of that um, movement of that action potential down the neuron at the same time then you get these um, uh, behind the action potential resetting up to move the potassium uh, into the cell and the sodium outside of the cell and, but this then propagates down uh, the axon, uh, increasing the sodium concentration, increasing the sodium concentration as it moves down, but then uh, reestablishing that um, sodium-potassium gradient uh, as the action potential passes. So many neurons look like this, where there's a cell body with dendrites attached to other um, neurons. And then a long axon, it can be quite long, sometimes up to even a couple of feet in length total, and then ending in ner nerve terminals. So sending the signal, this action potential down this axon um, works like this. You um, stimulate the neuron, which depolarizes um, the membrane, going from negative, uh, then suddenly positive, and then slowly back to negative. Um, and here's what's happened. Here's this steady state uh, situation. A stimulus is applied. It opens that uh, pore or channel. Uh, then you're uh, pumping the, pro the um, sodium and potassium again, and that eventually opens. opens that lid and eventually closes the channel as well, bringing it back to the original conformation ready for the next um, action potential or stimulus. Well, you can see on the graph here also that there is a green line going down here. So if you don't reach the depolarizing amount of electricity or the um, electropotential gradient, the gradient between the positive and the neg negative ions, then you don't get an action potential. So that means that the nerves don't constantly go off, but they require a certain amount of stimulus before they actually react. So here's another additional diagram that shows you the condition of those um, channels. So here uh, the channel is completely closed, but the lid is open. That's when you have the positive charges on the outside and negative charges on the inside. Um, but then you get an action potential beginning here where uh, you open up those channels uh, because uh, and now the sodium is flooding in, which causes a change in the conformation to close those lids again. And then once um, you get further down, not only are the lids closed, uh, 
Now the channel closes and the lid opens back up when you have a sufficient positive charge on the outside. And then this is just propagated uh, down uh, the increase in positivity on the inside, opens up those channels. You can see them opening here, allowing more sodium to flow through and opening other channels down the line. And then once that electrical potential has pretty much equilibrated, those lids close and then you get pumping uh, of the other, um, the transporter to pump sodium out through the other transporter, potassium in, um, get this to a positive charge on the outside, negative charge on the inside. That channel closes and the lid opens, ready for um, the next action potential to hit it. So there are several different types of uh, neurons, but they have some uh, common features. So in the case of uh, multipolar um, neurons or interneurons, there are dendrites on one end that are receiving signals from other um, cells. And then uh, there are long axons uh, followed by axon terminals, which are touching other neurons uh, to stimulate them. There are actually uh, motor neurons also, which have dendrites on, on one end, a, a cell body usually on one end, a long axon with um, uh, myelin sheaths, which insulate the, um, the long axons and, and allow longer perpetuation of the action potential. I'll, I'll show why that is in a few minutes. And then those are attached to muscles or activating something else. Uh, sensory neur neurons look like this, where there's the receptors on one side, an axon leading to the cell body, and then an axon leading to the terminals also, which are touching other uh, cells, usually interneurons and eventually uh, brain cells. So if you look at this diagram, uh, again, and you look at the sodium uh, flowing in, the sodium being pumped back out, um, and the perpetuation of this uh, action potential, um, you kind of wonder how long can this go on? There must be some leakiness in the system. So eventually you wouldn't have enough um, electrical potential to propagate that, um, that um, action potential. Uh, and that's true. So cells um, along the way in animals have uh, developed these myelin sheaths with uh, things called nodes of Ranvier. And that solves the problem of degradation of the signal over long distances. So here's how that works. Uh, here's the cell body. Here's the axon. But then it has these cells um, that surround each one of those neurons. And the cells have a lot of fats in them, so they're essentially insulators. So the sodium can't um, leak out um, or leak in, actually, in any one of those areas where you have one of these myelin sheaths. Uh, but then there are nodes every once in a while where you can continuously then um, propagate that axon action potential by allowing the outflow of ions and then the inflow of uh, the sodium ions once you have an action potential uh, coming down that neuron. So that protects any degradation of that signal over very long distances. And by long distances, I mean sometimes feet uh, for a single neuron. So here's a little bit of the anatomy of uh, those neurons. So this in the center, that's a neuron, has mitochondria. And then you can imagine on these um, membranes that will have the potassium uh, sodium transporters, as well as the sodium channels uh, that propagate that um, action potential. But then it has these Schwann cells. Uh, Schwann cells look like this when they're young and they continue continually uh, grow around that neuron uh, and those membranes insulate that particular part of the neuron. But then every once in a while they have gaps which allow free flow of the ions, including the sodium, potassium, 
uh, sodium and potassium ions. So in each place here you have those uh, sodium channels that can open up if um, they're hit with an action potential and then that uh, propagates the action potential onto um, the next node of Ranvier, the next node where more sodium can enter and propagate that action potential. So this has allowed uh, signals to get down the neuron, action potentials to get down the neuron, without much degradation in the signal at all. So neurons communicate with quite a few other neurons. And so this is a cell body here uh, with the axon here and then dendrites uh, stretching in different directions. And then uh, nerve terminals, these little things with the bulbs on them, that are extensions from other neurons. And so this is a connection between this neuron, this orange neuron, and then these white uh, extensions of a different neuron, or many different neurons. And so you get this uh, incredible integration of these uh, neurons with uh, other neurons, uh, creating many possible uh, pathways to uh, response by those different neurons. At each one of those contact points, uh, there's what is called a synapse, uh, where the electrical signal is changed into a chemical signal and then back into an electrical signal in the next um, neuron. So two basic types of uh, synapses, an excitatory synapse and then an inhibitory synapse. Um, some nerves need to be damped down at certain times, that is, to have an inhibitory synapse, and some are at a higher state of excitement, ready to uh, respond to an action potential. So an excitatory synapse has a um, high electron potential, electrochemical uh, um, gradient, and then you get a neurotransmitter, which will open up that um, channel to allow sodium ions to uh, go in, increase, uh, thus creating a, a, an action potential. On the other hand, an inhibitory synapse uh, will allow chlorine ions um, to enter, and that actually will um, cause um, an inhibition of any increase in sodium ions that move into that cell. So it kind of damps down any um, action potential that happens to occur in that neuron at the time. And so there's a very important balance in um, having the nerves overstimulated uh, versus um, inhibited. And so you need a, um, in the brain and elsewhere, there's a, a pretty fine balance between um, stimulation uh, and response in these uh, neurons. There also are a few other differences in synapses. So there are chem chemical synapses where you have an action potential which um, stimulates the release of a neurotransmitter. Um, uh, initially, it releases calcium into the, the cell. That calcium increase um, then causes a vesicle with the neurotransmitter to fuse with the membrane and to release that neurotransmitter into the synapse itself. And then those neurotransmitters attach to a receptor and then those receptors stimulate other things in uh, the adjoining, the postsynaptic cell, including a change in membrane potential, if there's going to be an action potential going further, uh, biochemical cascades, and sometimes gene expression. There also are electrical synapses, which have um, channels that join the two uh, cytosols together allowing uh, those sodium ions to pass through and uh, then uh, stimulating an action potential in the adjoining cell. Here are some more details uh, on the um, chemical synapse. An action potential uh, comes down the uh, axon, 
this then tends to uh, increase the influx of uh, both sodium ions and calcium ions. So two different types of channels. The calcium ions uh, cause uh, a vesicle that contains a neurotransmitter, which is acetylcholine in this case, causes that to fuse with the membrane and release the acetylcholine into the synapse. And those acetylcholines are then, uh, they attach to acetylcholine receptors, which then um, interact <clears throat> with the other, the opposite cell, the uh, postsynaptic cell, stimulating an action potential in that cell. The uh, leftover acetylcholine uh, then is uh, pumped back into that po uh, presynaptic cell uh, and then is uh, shuttled into a membrane uh, uh, material uh, that then forms a vesicle with the acetylcholine inside and it's ready for another influx of calcium and then fusing with the membrane to release that acetylcholine again into the synapse. So here it is diagrammatically. There's this um, voltage-gated um, calcium ion channel, uh, which uh, at the entry of a um, action potential that opens up, releasing the calcium, that causes this um, neurotransmitter, the acetylcholine, a vesicle to fuse with the membrane and release that acetylcholine or other neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter molecules then bind to the ligand gated uh, channel on the other um, cell, on the postsynaptic cell, which then cause that um, channel to open. Uh, and in, in some cases, these are then um, sodium channels which allow sodium into the cell and propagate the um, um, action potential. Motor neurons um, will uh, send their signals to a muscle cell uh, and then the muscle cell has other um, channels and pumps on it on each of the muscle cells and so I want to talk a little bit about um, how that signal is sent to the muscle and how the muscles contract um, upon that signal. So here's a muscle uh, contains these fascicles that are literally cells uh, filled with actin thin filaments and myosin uh, thick filaments. And we talked a little bit about that, that the myosin heads in um, in response to hydrolyzing ATP can change their position can attach to the actin molecule, uh, um, molecules, the uh, proteins, and then change their position again when they lose the ADP uh, and cause movement of those thick and thin filaments with respect to one another, thus contracting the muscle. So on this diagram, there are some important things to note. The actin and myosin uh, are connected into a myofibril. And then around that is what's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the sarcolemma, and then uh, a nucleus of nuclei are on the outside. And many of these cells are multinucleate, so uh, very special specialized cells. Uh, so here are a couple of diagrams illustrating that. Here's uh, one of those cells with the uh, actin and myosin in the center, and then this sarcoplasmic reticulum around it and normally innervated along this sarcolemma. Um, so there are a couple of different things to note about this, that sarcoplasmic reticulum surrounds the actin and myosin filaments, and that is very important. And if you look inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's filled with calcium ions. And so those are a very important part of muscle contraction. So this shows um, how the muscle contracts. An action potential comes down uh, from off of a neuron uh, and stimulates the release of calcium, opens calcium channels, 
um, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. That releases calcium into the cell. The calcium attaches to troponin. Now, troponin normally blocks tropomyosin sites, um, the sites that the, um, the heads, these heads on the uh, myosin need to stick to. So the myosin can't stick to the actin filaments. But the troponin, once it binds to calcium, um, is pulled off of the tropomyosin. The myosin um, thick filament can then um, bind to the actin thin filaments. And then there's ATP hydrolysis and movement of the myosin with respect to the, the actin. And so you get movement, contraction of that muscle. Uh, then to recharge, the calcium is actually pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by a transporter, not just a channel. So the transporter requires ATP to pump that calcium in there. Once the calcium concentration becomes low enough, the troponin then blocks the binding of the myosin and the muscle relaxes. And so you're brought back to the original uh, resting conformation or configuration. And here is that uh, calcium ATP pump. So initially there's a binding of two calcium molecules and that uh, then changes this activator domain. And then an aspartic acid is um, phosphorylated in that process, thus activating um, the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP that changes the overall um, conformation of this um, transporter and then forces the calcium out on the other side, thus uh, increasing the calcium concentration in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So again, that's this pump right here that requires ATP to pump the calcium in. And then this is a, a voltage-gated a channel here that then releases the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol, which then again attaches to the troponin, uh, which uncovers uh, the tropomyosin and allows the myosin to attach to the actin and start the process of contraction and movement. Okay, so that's uh, membranes in a nutshell. Uh, I think you can see that, that membranes uh, are crucial for life and they allow some very complex um, functions and, and things to occur in these cells um, and allow cells to communicate, allow cells to uh, react to the external environment, allow cells to change um, their structure uh, and allow this propagation of uh, an action potential, which is essentially just a change in the concentration of the ions, uh, which allows neurons to function and allows you know you to be listening to and looking at these slides right now. So pretty amazing. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you later.